This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream in partnership with Nebula, where I've just released my first ever Nebula original. Hey, happy Friday. This week we got some big announcements from Fairphone. The Honor brand basically regained all of their lost market share suddenly, and we saw our first ever non-Huawei phone that runs Huawei software. Our weekly tech knowledge quiz is also back with 20 brand new questions for you to have fun with. Getting 15 of them right gets you access to Crowd, so check it out. Links are in the description, and welcome to the Friday checkout. Okay, we had an incredibly busy week of new releases again, and my highlights start with the brand new smartphone from Wendy's. Yes, the fast food chain. Though you can't actually buy the phone, you have to join a contest, you have to be in Canada, and then you can be one of 20 people who win one. All of the specs beside the screen size are basically a mystery, and software support I assume would probably not exist for this device, because who the hell would support 20 phones, but there you go, a Wendy's phone. In equally ridiculous news, Amazon now has a home robot called Astro that its own developers reportedly internally say is terrible and will throw itself off of stairs. And by the way, it is depicted as being useful because it can bring beer despite not having any way to actually get beer because it doesn't have any arms. Other new releases from Amazon include the Echo Show 15, which is like a picture frame smart screen that you can hang on your wall. Then there is a new smart thermostat to take on Google's Nest line and Halo View, which has a built-in projector that is literally only pitched as a way to let kids play games while calling their grandparents so they don't get bored and just walk away. Amazon is in a really weird place with their hardware, I feel. Anyway, in maybe more useful news, Withings has just launched their ScanWatch Horizon that does a pretty good job at actually hiding that it is a smartwatch, and Logitech has just announced the MX Keys Mini, which is their regular flagship keyboard, just without the numpad, which I'm sure many people will be very happy about. There are also a ton of other new releases that I couldn't cover, lots of them are very interesting this week, so check out the full release monitor in the crowd app, it is linked down in the description. And one of the new releases that I wanted to talk about a little bit more in this video is the brand new Fairphone 4. This is the Dutch company's fourth attempt at making a more sustainable phone, and with it, they have also launched their first ever pair of wireless earbuds, both of which I find very interesting. So you probably know the basic concept behind the Fairphones by now. They can be disassembled, repaired very easily, the company will sell you spare parts and provide manuals, and they used as many environmentally sustainable practices that don't exploit workers along the way as possible. The new stuff this year falls in two categories. First, the product itself just seems like much less of a compromise than the ones that came before it. It now comes with two 48 megapixel cameras, one of which is an ultra wide. There are modern goodies here like night mode photography. The replaceable battery is finally a decent size, almost 4000 milliamp hours, which is a much needed jump from last year's 3000. And with the new Snapdragon 750, as well as 6 to 8 gigs of RAM or 128 to 256 gigs of storage, this looks to be the first Fairphone that should feel pretty snappy and not terrible. There are still trade-offs to modern phones like a 60Hz LCD screen, but you know what? People still buy iPhones with 60Hz screens as well, so whatever. The phone did get 140 euros more expensive this year, but this is the first Fairphone that shouldn't be a pain to use, so hooray. And second, on the sustainability front too, the company now offers a five-year warranty, far more than anything I've ever seen in phones. They now use fair trade gold for the first time ever in a phone, which is in addition to the other fair trade materials they already used before. And they say that they're now also electric waste neutral, as each time they sell a phone, they also responsibly buy back and recycle another one. So overall, I think that's a great update. And the only thing that I can't quite wrap my head around is the company now dropping the headphone jack, and like clockwork, they also started offering Bluetooth earbuds instead. I mean, on paper, these earbuds seem surprisingly well-priced, especially for a Fairphone product, coming in at 99 euros and offering even active noise cancellation and water resistance. But for a company that is supposedly all about sustainability, trading the headphone jack for wireless earbuds seems like a really odd choice. Sure, this pair might be slightly less terrible for the environment and slightly less terrible for the workers that created than other pairs, 
but true wireless earbuds are notorious for being super easy to break, super easy to lose, the batteries go to crap very quickly, there's basically no way of fixing them, including these, I think, there's no information on how they'll get fixed. And so this seems like a really odd choice for a company with the environmental mission of Fairphone. Anyway, I guess you could always just use USB-C earphones like I do, and um, I actually really like how the phone looks, so maybe that's not a big deal, but anyway, let me know how you feel about it down in the comments. Okay, my second story of the week will be Counterpoint releasing some very interesting new analysis showing that Honor managed to pull off an incredible comeback, at least in China, where they are now back to the 15% market share that they were at over a year ago, and they're also back to the third place again after previously having fallen out of the top five. That means Honor has already overtaken Xiaomi in China and they're basically about to take the place that Huawei has lost there too, which is just an incredible turnaround and here's how Counterpoint explains that. New releases like the Honor 50 series that were apparently met with quote pent up demand from loyal Huawei and Honor consumers who held on to their devices and did not switch to other brands, coupled with the R&D capabilities as well as the distribution networks that Honor has inherited from Huawei altogether were enough to catapult them ahead. In other words, Honor has taken a lot of the tech, and at least in China, also most of the distribution, and also many of the customers from Huawei, which on the one hand is kind of impressive, on the other hand, really makes you think how separate of a company this is from Huawei. As I've said in previous videos, the new Honor phones are so obviously just Huawei phones under a different brand, and the company is now owned by a conglomerate where the largest shareholder is a municipal government in China. Surely, if the US had a problem with Huawei selling phones and being connected to the Chinese government, they would have those same issues with Honor doing the same too, right? And indeed, coming as a surprise to no one, they are currently debating blocking Honor too. It's not a surprise. Anyway, my third story is kind of related to this and I have to say I'm a little bit proud of myself because I kind of predicted this. Kind of. So the background story is that the Chinese company Le TV is back from the dead with a new phone called the S1. And uh, this wouldn't be a super interesting story on its own, it's a pretty forgettable entry-level phone, and definitely not the super phone the company teased a few months ago. Instead, there are two interesting parts here. First, the S1 is heavily marketed as a fully Chinese product, which is not only assembled in China, but also uses key components like a Unisoc chip, as well as a battery and screen from Chinese suppliers, among others, which I'm sure we'll see more of in the future. But second, and this is the part that I sort of predicted, it also comes with Huawei mobile services pre-installed. So as far as I can tell, this includes the background services developed by Huawei that handle location services, authentication, etc. Basically the equivalent of what Google typically does on devices outside of China, and also a couple of Huawei's first party apps like Huawei Music and Huawei Books. As far as I can tell, this is the first proper third party phone adopting HMS, and it kind of makes sense for Le TV to just go with whatever Huawei is offering since they are just starting from scratch. And while the company technically uses its own M Android fork, which by the way hilariously is built upon Android 9 from three years ago, it means that Huawei is now officially the platform provider on this device. Huawei is to Le TV basically what Google is to other device makers outside of China, which is the first step of what I predicted in this video from a couple of months ago, where I said that since they can't really make many phones on their own, they'll try to become a platform provider for other devices. So this is a small step with a small player, but well done, I guess. Okay, and while I am praising my own work, let me show you something that I'm super excited about. This is the intro to my first ever Nebula original. Technorama is a brand new series that I've made with a great team. It is a love letter to the weird and wonderful ways technology gets portrayed in movies, and we apply my kind of analysis to find deeper meanings behind the killer robots, iconic aliens, etc. on screen. The first episode that just went live takes a look at the technophobia in the early days of cinema, all the way up to the 50s. We have many more episodes planned, and Nebula is a wonderful platform that lets us make big experiments like this, where we get to hire crews and dare to work on stuff outside of just our usual topics without having to worry about upsetting the algorithm around our main YouTube channels. 
If you want to support our work, signing up for Nebula is a fantastic way to do just that, as it gets you ad-free access to content from some of YouTube's smartest creators, often even before stuff goes live on YouTube, and it lets us make better content for you all. Best of all, you can get access to all of Nebula for free with a subscription to my sponsor, CuriosityStream, which itself is just 15 bucks for an entire year. That's like barely more than a dollar a month. CuriosityStream is of course the premier place on the internet to watch high quality professional documentaries from the founder of the Discovery Channel, and they have a huge library of science, nature, and history content to watch. I've recently finished watching an episode of Catalyst on CuriosityStream, which took a closer look at the potential of quantum computing, and there's a ton of other great content here from hosts like David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, Stephen Hawking, and more. So check them out at the link in the description, and I'll see you next week.